Welcome to The Authority File, the podcast that features conversations about the life cycle of scholarly communication. I'm Bill Mickey, your host and the editorial director at Choice. In this series, we're going to be talking about skills, not nunchuck skills or bow hunting skills or computer hacking skills, but librarian skills. See what I did there? My guests and I will be riffing off of a recent report published by Technology from Sage with collaboration from Skilltype called the Librarian Skills Landscape. We'll highlight and expand on many of the key takeaways from the report, but we'll also talk about real skill building initiatives happening in academic institutions. Joining me on this four episode series, which is brought to you with generous support from Sage, are David Erlinson, Head of Cataloging and Metadata Services at Rice University's Fondren Library. Marcy Simons, Director Hesburgh Libraries at the University of Notre Dame. Matthew Weldon, Library Patron Consultant at Technology from SAGE and an author of this report. And Tony Zanders, Founder and CEO at Skilltype. In this first episode, we're introduced to our guests and we learn about the context of the Librarian Skills Report from Tony and Matthew, while David and Marcy provide an on the ground look at the respective skill building initiatives and staff priorities at their institutions. Okay, welcome everybody. It's great to have you on the program. So why don't we uh, start with introductions? Um, you know, can each of you just briefly describe what you do in your current roles? And and Marcy, why don't we start with you? Sure. Um, my official title is the director for Esperg Libraries Organizational and Personnel Development, and that encompasses uh, all of the things you can imagine training and development, talent, culture, reward recognition programs, um, employee engagement. Our talent is focused on everything from recruiting to offboarding and everything in between. So pretty big job, but it's a pretty great job too. And I've been with the University of Notre Dame for 37 years. Wow, good for you. So, I mean, so that sounds like a pretty human resources type role. Yes. 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 Okay. Great. And David, how about you? Uh, Sure. My name is Dave Erlinson. I'm the uh, head of cataloging and metadata services at Fondren Library, uh, Rice University down in Houston. Um, So I've been in this role for a a couple years now, but my background is more, you know, kind of database techie type of stuff. Um, currently, I'm leading a, a team of 11 and trying to build uh, new skills as we, you know, uh, get into this whole, you know, hybrid new working world that we're in. Um, I was previously a chair of our library training, travel and development committee, um, which gives me a little bit of insight into, um, you know, how people uh, approach training at our library. Um, and yeah, I'm I'm big into tech and and finding shortcuts or hacks to you know help us in our our daily lives. So uh, very into things like Python and and trying to figure out where um, large language models and AI are are going to take us in the near future. Excellent, thank you, David. Uh, Matthew, over to you. Thanks very much, Bill. Uh, I'm a library patron consultant at Technology from Sage, uh, and in my role, I focus both on uh, pedagogy and using technologies in a pedagogically sound way, uh, but also working with uh, institutions and partners across the higher education sector. Um, And I worked with colleagues in both in TFS and at Skilltype um, with uh, the Librarian Futures Part 3 report that we're uh, talking about today. I also I um, worked with colleagues at TFS on uh, Librarian Futures Part 2 as well. Fantastic. And last but not least, Tony. Hello, everyone. I'm Tony Zanders. I'm the founder and CEO at Skilltype. Um, since 2018, I've been running a company that builds software for libraries to understand their skills better, um, also what skills they need to develop for the future. Um, and we build tools for each person to uh, personalize that, that skill development pathway for themselves. Um, as the CEO, uh, I'm responsible for our talent management as well. Um, that involves um, identifying people to join our company, um, ensuring everyone has their own pathways to grow, and also asking ourselves, how do we 
continue reimagining our work in this new world of AI and AI assisted jobs. Um, and as a software company, it, it um, hits pretty close to home. And so <laughs> I'm excited to, to discuss all these topics today. Great. Thank you, Tony. Um, and, and that's a great segue into my next question. And I'll just stick with you, Tony and, and Matthew. And I'm wondering if you could just sort of set the stage for us for uh, the recent report that you collaborated on that examines the librarian skills landscape. Um, I mean, we'll be referencing this report quite a bit in our conversations. Um, how did it originate? And, you know, and what did you then set out to, to discover? I'll let Matthew go because it's the third in a series of reports and I think that context is helpful and I can sure. Yeah, no, no worries at all. Thanks, Tony. Um, yeah, so as Tony mentioned, it's it's part three um, in our series. Uh, what we did in the, the, the first part, and this was back in 2021, I believe, um, is we sort of conducted a research and identified a knowledge gap, that knowledge gap being that... Um, you know, students weren't necessarily fully aware of the full range of services that were available to them through the academic library. And in turn, um, a lot of librarians weren't fully uh, aware of the evolving needs of, of patrons. And we um, we really drilled into that knowledge gap in the second uh, white paper, which was, you know, it, it focused on that and, and dived into that a little bit. And then uh, last year, so we published part two in April last year, April 2023, and uh, we held in that same month, we held our inaugural Technology from Sage Insight Conference in Birmingham in the UK, and Tony was there, and we just launched this new uh, report. We were sort of already thinking about what we wanted to investigate next, um, and Tony came and uh, gave a great presentation um, at the at our insight conference and really we i think we saw a lot of uh ground that we could kind of cover together we we could work together to um develop this report and i, I think 2023 in hindsight was a year of really a lot of uncertainty and a lot of change i think chat gpt if memory serves sort of really hit at the end of 2022 in, in December and it meant that suddenly the academic world was kind of having to wrestle with generative AI in a major way um, upon coming back to work in January. Um, and I think we saw that that was a challenge that librarians were going to be really well placed to uh, tackle and address, but also one that was going to require both the development of pre-existing skills um, and uh, working to to acquire new skills as well. So working together to sort of investigate those skills that were going to be needed um, seemed like a, a pretty natural step for the uh, the next instalment in the, the series. Yeah, and as Matthew noted, the conversation began in, in April of 2023, and um, it was um, an opportunity we saw to uh, leverage the community skill type has built over the past five years. Um, we, we work with over 200 libraries uh, across eight countries, and the needs of these libraries are more common than and similar amongst them than you would imagine, um, especially when it comes to, to skill development for uh, information professionals. And so uh, we saw it as a natural opportunity to sort of invite this community to participate in, in a study um, to document their needs. Uh, it's not the first study of its kind. You do see um, research um, done sort of interviewing people and, and organizations on what they need. I think what sort of made it unique was um, the timing of it, as, as, as Matthew mentioned. Because of generative AI, we all of a sudden are um, having a knee-jerk reaction to how does this impact our work? What does it mean for librarianship? Uh, and it was interesting to capture a snapshot of what the sentiment was uh, in the fall of 2023. Um, and so uh, I think I'm curious also to hear uh, from, from Marcy and David and others. Um, they um, are a part of that workforce uh, that was surveyed, working directly in-house uh, with their colleagues. Um, and you know, happy to continue to share insights if you have other questions, depending where you want to take the conversation, Bill. 
Yeah, sure. Thank you, Tony. Um, yeah, one thing I am curious about uh, off the bat, and I think this might help with, with this first episode of the series, is if just focusing on skill type a little bit. Um, I mean, I'm wondering if you have sort of a boilerplate, you know, elevator pitch style description of the librarian, the professional librarian market, you know, academic librarian market, um, in terms of how skill type is kind of, um, how skill type describes it, uh, you know, in terms of um, job descriptions, responsibilities, um, if there are general characteristics that you've teased out, because just anecdotally from our experience, there seems to be a lot, you know, budgets are a big uh, factor in this and uh, librarian roles are kind of evolving in a way where they're taking on a variety of different responsibility and tasks um, and that may or may not be reflected in job titles necessarily so I'm wondering if if you know what 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 you're seeing from your point of view from skill type sure um, I think to this exact point we made a design decision uh, a few years ago, not to um, focus on job title um, yeah. for our users and for our, our community. Um, job titles, in our estimation, are extremely uh, colloquial uh, to an institution. Yeah, um, right. You could have the same title of a librarian one or two or three or four, and your university right up the road may have a very different definition of what that entails. And it's a lot of factors that have nothing to do with the library. In some cases, it, it could be determined by whether the university has uh, shared IT services and or do they rely on the library to provide some of those services and other historical factors. And so um, from our perspective, we saw an opportunity to instead um, peg um, to what we describe as job categories. Job categories um, were inspired by a few different standards out there, including the, the Association of Research Libraries. Um, so the ARL does an annual report uh, every October that its members um, complete. And that mm -hmm. report asks each library to, to choose uh, from among about 40 categories or so of jobs. And that sits across their 120 or so plus membership. And so we took that as a core and started to expand upon it because we have to support other types of libraries as well, uh, including medical health science, public libraries and others. Uh, but the job category is something that I think has uh, a lot of legs to it. It is rapidly evolving as well. It's a more, yeah. I would say, uh, resilient framework than, than job titles. Um, um, they're less regulated by like campus HR policy and labor law. Uh, and as a result, you can update them more, more quickly. Um, from our perspective, we can also map discrete skills and competencies to each category. And it gives us a vantage point of understanding overlap among categories. Um, in it, because in the real world, many of our colleagues are wearing multiple hats. Mm -hmm. And the hats they wear may not be indicative by the title they have. Right. Um, so right. that's uh, just some of the vantage points we've been able to gain um, supporting a, a large community uh, using software. Excellent. Thank you, Tony. Um, Marcy and David, I saw you both shaking your, nodding your heads uh, to what Tony was just explaining. Does that make sense from from your perspective as well? Yeah, I think so. Um, the uh, what I really like about skill type is you can declare skills and and interests, so you can kind of declare what you feel you've got and where you'd like to go as well. Mm -hmm. um, so if there's anyone out there who isn't on skill type, um, I, I think that kind of gives you a, a an overview of uh, kind of what the software does and, and how it can be used. Um, it can help people explore their own interests as well. Um, so just kind of taking that time to think about, okay, here's what I'm doing and here's what I'd like to be doing is is important. Right. Yeah, and I'll add that um, we uh, partnered with SkillType last year, so we're still looking, finding all the various ways that it can help us with talent building and professional development and skills. But what I've heard people really like about it is there's the self-assessment, here are the skills that I think I have. Then the manager takes that and says, hmm, maybe not quite yet, but this is good to know that you're interested in learning more about that skill. So let's put that in a development plan. So having mm -hmm. both focuses and the opportunity to pull 
uh, reports together with that information, we're finding super helpful. Okay. So sticking with you, Marcy and David, um, you know, along those lines, I mean, I'm wondering how you would characterize, you know, the current state of skill building at your respective institutions. You know, how are you and your colleagues handling professional development, maybe irrespective of, of skill type? Um, is there a formal process or opportunity framework in place, or is it a little bit more ad hoc? How does that work? And Marcy, I'll, we'll just stick with you okay. for now. Yeah, this is a large part of what I've been doing. So I should also say my role is new, and I keep looking at Tony because he knows my dean. <laughs> uh, Dr. K. Matthew Dames uh, is new. This is his third year here at the university. And uh, one of the things I really appreciated most about what he did when he came in is we were a little lax on process and procedure before. And he was like, no, we have to have mm. process, procedure. People need to know what to expect. It needs to be, I love, David, hearing that you actually have a committee that does travel and professional development reviews. Because the first time we put this process together, people are like, what do you mean? I got to ask somebody for it. I just used to go before. I used to have the money. So we put a process and procedure in place. And along with it, um, we were sure to let people know the second thing the dean did was he was able to get us an endowment for professional development funding. Wow. So we are we have some really great opportunities to provide generous support for all of our library faculty and staff to go to conferences, get training, attend a webinar. Um, I don't want to say cost isn't a, a factor because it is, but so far, we haven't had to say no to anyone, and that's been the most rewarding part about it. So where people initially were like, I got to fill out a form, and when I said yes, but like, we will probably be able to support your request. It's not about saying no. It's about putting the procedure in place that everybody follows so everyone knows it's a consistent approach and they're all being evaluated the same way. Excellent. David, how about you? Nice. Uh, yeah, great, Marcy. I'm, I'm also taking notes on trying to get an endowment uh, made. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I think our library does a, a lot of things uh, really well when it comes to training and development um, for all Fondren staff, whether you're a librarian or, you know, just a, a, a staff at, in access services or something like that. Um, we get, a, you know, a certain amount that everyone can use each year. Um, not everyone goes through their entire uh, budget. Um, but it, it's kind of up to them uh, in terms of the the opportunities that they want to pursue. Um, likewise, we have a, a process in place. Um, I, I would highly recommend Adobe Sign for um, going through some of these things where you can, you know, email. We used to, uh, before the pandemic, we had paper forms and it was like, oh, how can we walk this to someone else's desk uh, when everyone's <laughs> right. working from home, right? Um so, uh, yeah, there's uh, some really novel uses we've seen with this funding or, or requests. Not all of them are necessarily funded. Um, you know, some people have, uh, instead of wanting to, like, go to an event, they've said, hey, can I take my funding and try to bring in a specialist uh, to do a little presentation at the library? That way, you know, all staff can attend if they want. Um, we also had some requests to, like, stay up to date on certain news feeds. You know, there, there are certain... Uh, memberships or, you know, whatever that you can pay for, uh, you know, like library focused or social, uh, social sciences focused, you know, whatever, um, that are, you know, maybe not funded, but, uh, there's a committee that kind of reviews those requests and, and tries to take a, again, a, an even process, uh, for every request and it gets talked about, um, and then flows through, you know, the manager of the committee and the, the university librarian. Um, yeah, we had, a. Uh, we had implemented skill type uh, relatively recently as well, Marcy. Um, we got into it as part of a, we're part of a consortium with uh, Amigos Library Services. Um, so we got to try out skill type for a couple years um, and we're in the middle of uh, kind of year one going on to year two now. Um, so uh, yeah, it, it's great because it, uh, it fits a, a unique part of our overall training and development landscape. It allows people to really catch up on stuff they might've missed and I think that's one thing skill type does particularly well. Um, so I'm seeing a lot of stuff like I wasn't able to attend Charleston, the conference last year, but um, there's a lot of things on my feed right now that are, oh, I can get caught up on that. Um, 
challenges. Of course, we're, we're still facing challenges in funding, right? Um, getting someone to an in-person event is like increasingly expensive. Yeah. Um, you know, a, a week long in-person conference can easily go beyond the funding limits that we've got. Um, so you gotta be, you gotta be thrifty, right? Um, recently our, our staff and our, our committee kind of discussed that people tend to get more out of in-person trainings. Um, but, uh, you know, attending webinars and hybrid conferences are, are great to engage where you otherwise might not be able to. Um, but it, it's just really easy to get distracted and finding yourself paying more attention to email than, than the content that people are discussing. So, yeah, um, I, I think we're doing a lot. Um, there's some really great uh, other things that we do. We, we actually fund memberships for people as well. So if people need to cover their, you know, ALA membership. Um, you know, we can do that, uh, same with archivists and, you know, all those professional organizations. Um, I think that might be a little bit novel out there in the academic library world. Um, but it, it tends to pay kind of for itself down the line. Uh, you tend to get discounts and, um, other things, uh, by having those memberships. So it's, it's usually worthwhile. I, I would encourage people and, and institutions to think about that as well. You just heard from David Erlinson, Head of Cataloging and Metadata Services at Rice University's Fondren Library, Marcy Simons, Director Hesburgh Libraries at the University of Notre Dame, Matthew Weldon, Library Patron Consultant at Technology from SAGE and author of the Librarian Skills Landscape Report, and Tony Zanders, Founder and CEO of SkillType. This episode was brought to you with generous support from SAGE. Join us next week when we dive into the Librarian Skills Landscape Report and highlight the key takeaways, such as the kinds of tools and products librarians consider important and a current lack of confidence in assisting the library community with AI questions. As always, underwriting opportunities for the Authority File podcast are directed by Choices Advertising Director Pam Marino, and all of our episodes are produced and edited by Choices Digital Media Producer Sabrina Kofer, with support from Digital Media Assistant Ashley Roy. That's all for this week. Thanks for joining us.